Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you to our Calhoun Lecture Series. Uh, this is our second Calhoun Lecture of this 2011-2012 uh, academic year. Uh, I want to thank the patrons for continuing to support this lecture series. Um, also want to thank them for uh, hosting a membership drive, uh, which, which we had uh, a little over a week ago, which unfortunately I couldn't make. I had to be in Washington, D.C. and had to go up and, and do some of my begging that I always have to do. Believe it or not, th there is still some money in Washington, D.C. And uh, so some of us have to go up there and try to, try to bring some down. Uh, but I understand we had a, a successful drive and we were able to, to bring some new members in and, and I'm very appreciative of that. Um, and I'm going to be introducing our speaker this evening, uh, a speaker that I feel like we're very fortunate to have, uh, somebody I've actually known for a few years. I have his bio right here. I can read a couple things off his bio, but I also have to say a couple other, other things about him. <clears throat> now, I'll be pretty nice, I promise, I promise. Um, but uh, Dr. Eric Benson is with us tonight. Uh, he's a very well-qualified entomologist, um, has all the requisite degrees that he needs to have to have a job here at Clemson University, uh, including a PhD from Clemson, which he received in 1997. 1988. You're right, that's what it says. Because you started working at Clemson in 1997. And uh, I guess prior to that, you gallivanted around the globe a little bit and and worked for some chemical companies and agricultural companies and, and did a stint at Auburn University um, and then the lights came back on and he, he returned back home to, to Clemson. And like I said, I've, I've known Eric and his wonderful wife Lisa for, for many years um, because my wife Nancy and I have children that are relatively the same age as, as their children. And their, uh, their son, Corey, is uh, right in between the middle of our son, Corey, and our son, Nick. And so, you know, as they grow up through all those stages, we're involved in all those things together. And uh, uh, Boy Scouts was one of the big things that, that, that our son, Nick, and their son, Corey, was involved in. And, and Dr. Benson has been very involved in the local scout troop here. And, um, and, and I think... Way back when, on one of the Cub Scout trips, uh, the Bensons got to witness our son get very ill one evening, and, and we got to pack up our campsite at 1 o'clock in the morning and head back to Clemson, and, and we will never forget that. <laughs> as, a, as a wonderful evening, we spent out in, out in the woods together. Um, but that's not what you want to hear about tonight. What you want to hear about tonight is bugs. And we have the bug expert with us here today. I got a chance to listen to him. He was on the Your Day program again this week, and he's been on that program, uh, he informed me tonight, for 12 years. That's hard, hard for me to believe that he's been on that program for 12 years. Um, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Eric Benson. How's that sound? Pretty good? All right. Yeah, I've got to be wired in remotely. I'm a mover, so there we go. Well, before I start, I have to say I have never given a talk where there was a floral arrangement <laughs> dedicated to my talk. This is, uh, this is maybe the high point of my year so far. Um, and I can tell there's bed bugs in there, and I believe this is a bed, so thank you very much. You know, when you're an extension entomologist, you're used to showing up with your projector and your computer and sometimes the screen and the extension cord and the table. And to walk in here and have everything done was just, was just amazing. So I really appreciate it. And I'm quite honored to uh, have been invited to talk about this. And I thought it was kind of unusual. You know, bed bugs is kind of a weird topic, you know, especially after dinner, sorry, beforehand. 
uh, you know, with the Calhoun Lecture Series, really dealing with uh, policy conversations. And yet, the more I thought about it, um, and the angle that I'm going to take with this talk is there is a lot of policy con conversations that need to go on when it comes uh, to deal with bed bugs. So if you thought you were going to leave here and know exactly what you have to do in case you get bed bugs or how you'll never get bed bugs, you might be disappointed. I will talk about it a little bit. I'm an extension entomologist and, and can't help but give some information. But um, it is quite a controversial topic. And, and South Carolina might be a little behind the other states, especially states like New York and Ohio, and you'll see why in just a bit. Uh, but it is an important conversation that we need to have. But I will at one point get to why you should look under the, the bed covers, and I have to thank my lovely daughter for this, um, this picture that she drew for me. You know, if you are like me, and most of you probably are looking out at the audience, um, you, never, you never saw a bed bug in your life. How many of you actually have seen a bed bug? How many of you were ever bitten by bed bugs before recently? Okay, Dr. Cheesem's been bitten by bed bugs. Um, well, I have some here. They're not alive, but uh, we'll pass them around. They're, they're, in, uh, they're in hand sanitizer, actually, so you can kind of get a three-dimensional picture. And I realize that it's a little dark in here, but most people have never seen bed bugs. Not, people aren't really sure what they are. And I could be um, Calvin here, in fact, that would be me, um, you know, with my mom saying good night. She said that, you know, and I love this. You know, kiss Cobbs good night. And she said, you know, if you don't get a good night kiss, you get Kafta dreams. Isn't that cool? Kafta, who wrote Metamorphosis, you know, about the vermin, the, the cockroach essentially, so foreshadowing in a Calvin and Hobbes cartoon. But she says, sleep tight, don't let the bed bugs bite. Well, of course, Calvin and Hobbes are worried about vermin under the bed. And in the next scene, we have them being attacked by a giant bed bug. And of course, they're making a ruckus. And what, is, what does Calvin do? He goes and gets a can of Raid, right? We want to get a can of Raid and spray it out. Because what does Raid do? Raid kills bugs dead. It doesn't just kill bugs. Raid kills bugs dead, right? Great marketing. That's how they market their products. So you get the can of Raid and you spray it out. And of course, um, disaster uh, averted. Well, and that's about all we knew about bed bugs until recently because bed bugs are back. And there are humorous things. In fact, there's this cartoon that I took a picture of. I know it's a little fuzzy, but it's bed bugs at a, at a convention in New York City. And one bed bug says to the other, if you can see it, the thing I love most about New York, the people. <laughs> so, and New York has been pretty much ground zero for bed bug infestations in North America. Now, fortunately, Bed bugs, from a, a medical view, are not known to transmit any diseases to humans, not serious diseases. They've been found to, to harbor about 27 fairly serious diseases, but never shown clinically or in any importance to vector diseases. So that's a good thing. You know, so if you wanna, if you wanna kill a human being, you know, don't get a grizzly bear, don't get a shark, don't get a bed bug, you know, you get a mosquito, that's a whole nother lecture. But of course, the, 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 just the bites from bed bugs can leave allergic reaction in some people, not all people, and that's significant. And of course, there's an emotional and mental toll of people experiencing bed bug bites. And there have been secondary infestations, or infections, excuse me, staph infections of people scratching. So where it may not be too serious, what if you were this person and you woke up in your hotel room with those bites? Can you imagine? And then you call up the extension entomologist and he says, well, they've been known to have 27 different diseases, but they don't vector them and blah, blah, blah. Or how are you going to feel towards the hotel that you were just visiting? What, what recompense would you like? Just your money back? Change your room? Can you think of anything worse than that? Actually, I can right there. What if it's your grandbaby? What if it's your daughter or your child? And bed bugs have become extremely controversial. Bed bug United States have become very litigious. Uh, it's really caused a serious problem throughout the whole country from this biting bug. Beyond just you or me probably going on a trip somewhere in the world in a hotel, bed bugs and the indigent is an extremely serious problem. Folks, um, homeless folks staying in shelters, um, individuals that don't have the monetary wherewithal to take care of treatments, and treatments are very expensive, and we'll talk about that, can live with horrible infestations. This mattress here is just covered 
with bed bug droppings, frass, parts. And then what do you do with that? What do you do with this bed if someone comes in? Do you put it on the street corner for someone else to pick up, perhaps? And I don't know if you can tell, but they ripped it here and they wrote bed bug on it. But what if you can't read English? What if you're desperate? Or what if you want to rip off that bottom cover and then maybe sell it at a secondhand shop with the bed bugs still in that mattress? And you know the cold day here is not going to kill the bed bugs in that mattress. So knowledge of the problem is, a, is an extreme problem that we're in. And this is good while we're having this lecture, because we need to have this conversation. We haven't had it enough, certainly in South Carolina. Viable control measures are problematic, but there's more of them. Five years ago, 10 years ago, we really didn't know what to do. We have a pretty good handle on what to do now, and it's improving almost daily. And then cost of control is very problematic. Um, getting a little ahead of myself, but if you have bed bugs in one of your single resident homes and you have three bedrooms and two baths and 2,000 square feet, you're going to pay thousands of dollars likely to have it dealt with. If you have um, an apartment complex, you're going to pay thousand, two thousand dollars and it can get very expensive very fast and many people can't afford it. How's this for timely? February 23rd, 2012, National Public Radio. That would be today. This was a radio show, and it talks about banks have acquired all these defaulted properties all across the United States. So these huge banks have acquired properties, a lot of them apartment complexes, but I don't want to pick on any one bank, but you have this mega bank, but they don't, they're not going to have property managers on site taking care of the, of the location. So the story was about you know, broken pipes and broken glass and so on and so forth, but the picture and some of the conversation of this poor haggard woman was about bed bugs, and nobody will do anything. She's a, she's a tenant there. She can't afford bed bug control. And all those smears on the wall are bed bugs that she smashed. And she makes comments that, well, they're, they're, it's the bed bugs' blood. It's not the bed bugs' blood. It's her blood. The bed bugs have fed on her. She smashed them on the wall, and the, those markings are her blood. So this is a serious problem, and I don't know how she's dealing with it, but she has some sort of foam mattress here that she's flipping up on the wall, probably putting down at night, but obviously uh, has an infestation that's severe and not controlled. So I want to go back to the beginning. I've kind of jumped ahead and talked about some of the problems, but you know, bed bugs, probably along with cockroaches, have been with man since recorded time. Linnaeus gave them the Latin binomial cymex lectularis. It's from Latin cymex blood, a bug, excuse me, lectularis, bed or couch. The Greeks tended to call them chorus. Chorus was to bite, but it also became synonymous with a bug to the Greeks. And just a little um, tidbit here, coriander is named after chorus and, uh, and cilantro as well. And the thought is, no one knows for sure, but the odor of coriander and especially cilantro, that kind of pungent odor, apparently to the Greeks, Greeks smelled like bed bugs. How many of you have smelled bed bugs in here? See, if I brought live ones in, you'd all be sniffing bed bugs right now. It, it's an interesting odor. It's a very distinct odor. And to me, it, it's a sweet odor. And if you've ever bitten your lip or had you know, blood in your mouth, and we all have, there's that smell to it almost that taste to it, and it makes sense because they're feeding on blood. Now, there's been all kinds of names. You know, the Spanish calls them chinches, and when I first, um, chinche, when I first, someone called me up to talk about chinches, I was thinking, okay, chinch bugs, you have chinch bugs in your grass, completely different group, talking about bed bugs. And of course, leave it to the English-speaking countries to have all kinds of uh, very interesting names, and there's about 50 of these, by the way. Wall louse, wallpaper flounder, that's interesting. Night rider, red coat, that was probably by the, the uh, early Americans in the 1700s when we're fighting the British. Crimson rambler, mahogany flat, and it goes on and on and on, quite colorful. And again, just to get the biology straight before we go back into some more of the societal problems, you know, and I'm always making this point, there's not one bug, there's not two bugs, there's a whole bunch of bugs. Bed bugs are part of the group called hemiptera, which are the true bugs. You know, to call all insects bugs is, is technically incorrect. But, we, but this group, the hemipterans, in which the bed bugs are in the family simicity, are true bugs, so bug is the appropriate term. There's at least 22 genera, probably more, at least 74 different species. There's 12 genera that attack bats. 
which is significant. Nine genera that attack birds. And there's three main species that we find on man. Leptocymex butte, which has not been found yet in the United States as far as we know. Won't that be interesting when we get this bug and I have to talk to people about it, you know, something that bites their butte. Uh, <laughs> Cymex hemipterus, which I'm surprised it's not here. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it isn't. The old and new world tropics, and then Cymex lectularis. And as I talk about the bed bug, that is the species that we're talking about, and that's the picture there. Found throughout the United States, have, have been in the United States for centuries, about 3 16 of an inch, and that's why I, I send them around. A lot of people think they're invisible or really tiny. They're not really tiny. The adults are quite large, and you just kind of keep passing them around if you'd like, or if everyone's seen them, you can hold on to them. Um, reddish brown, broadly oval, and extremely flat, and that's the thing. If you're, you know, about the size of maybe an apple seed or so, but they're paper thin, and being so thin, they can squeeze into almost any crack or crevice for refuge and uh, for hiding to come out when they want to at night and feed on humans. They will also, if they can, feed on birds, rodents, bats, and sometimes there are, there are documentations of pets, but by and large, the bed bug wants us. You know, with a lot of other ectoparasites, they actually prefer a different animal and they'll feed on us if they can. But when it comes to the human bed bug, they want us first and foremost. And there's three things a pest needs in any structure. Food, water, shelter. And if you can attack any, any one of those three things, you can help control the pest. But think of the bed bug. Where does it get its food? Where does it get its water? So the only thing left that you're left with, really, is dealing with the shelter, and we'll talk about that. Just very quickly, you know, females lay one to five eggs per day, they can go up to 500, four, four days to three weeks to, to develop. They go, you know, from three weeks to several months to develop from egg stage, basically, to adult. They usually have five, uh, they have five molts, each one requiring a blood meal, and they'll have additional meals on top of that. So unfortunately, some insects that need blood meals will only take a blood meal when they need it to molt to the next stage or to lay their eggs. Bed bugs will feed even if they don't need to molt or lay eggs. Um, the bottom line is you can have um, about four generations of bed bugs in a structure anywhere, at any time, in all stages. Eggs, the very young, immatures, or larvae, and the adults. So you have all the stages there. They harbor in clusters. They're not social, but they harbor in clusters. Um, 10 years ago, with Pat Zangoli, if I had seen this, and this is a little phone jack switch plate of an apartment I was in with bed bugs, I would have thought those were cockroach droppings, German cockroach droppings. But that's not, those are actually blood specks from the person sleeping in the bed next to this taken away. But this is a bed bug harborage. They'll get in all kinds of cracks or crevices, bed dressers, picture frames, armoires, so on and so forth. And those of us who uh, are used to cockroaches and working with cockroaches know cockroaches are pretty fast. Bed bugs are fast too. When they leave their harborage, they can really move long distances. In fact, when I first started to see them in apartment complexes, I was like, wow, I can't believe how quickly they'll move if they want to move. But again, it's that thin body, that thin, thin body that makes them so problematic in control. So here's a little screw, just a little screw and a headboard, and there's a bug. I think that's a bug, there's a bug there. Bug here, there's an egg right there. So in the smallest screw head, you can have all the different stages of bed bugs. Here's a, whoops, a headboard um, with particle board and all the bugs and eggs in there. So you may look at a headboard, you may look at, at a piece of furniture, and it looks fine, it looks intact, but they're so small, as far as being thin, they can squeeze into those little places, and obviously that's problematic. Uh, the mattress. Uh, this is terrible infestation. They love the piping, the seams, the box springs of mattresses. We are talking about it. You know, you, you put sheets over this, but they're going to crawl in and out around the, the sheets. So um, mattresses are their preferred places. Um, and that's hence the name bed bug. There's been a fair amount of research in the last few years. It's a repeat of research that had been done in the 60s, in the 50s, 40s, and before that. And there's a reason why they're called bed bugs. They prefer to harbor around beds because they feed on us when we sleep. They tend to feed on us when we sleep. However, in large infestations, they will move to other places of the structure. And if you spend time in a lounge chair, 
uh, any place else, they can move to those locations too. And of course, this is what we all worry about. If there were to be bed bugs in this hotel room, you have your suitcase there, you're there for several days, you could easily take a bed bug home. It's not conclusive yet, but one of our graduate students, Margie Leonard's done research where it looks like if a stage of bed bugs going to move, it's actually the gravid females, or the females that have been mated and have viable eggs. They're the most likely to hitchhike on belongings and go from point A to point B, which is adaptive, if you will, as far as distributing bed bugs. This is a small nymph. I have people tell me they, they have chiggers in their bedroom because they think chiggers is a red bug. Really what you're talking about with chiggers is the red bite mark that's left behind. But they say, I, I had chiggers in my bedroom. I see all these little red things running around. And I'm like, uh-oh. Uh, the very first instars um, get replete with blood and look bright red. And it is almost comical. They go from this paper-thin bug to this balloon-like creature in about three minutes when they feed. And this is the feces and the droppings. And these are the cast um, um, shells, if you will, of the eggs that have already hatched out, the bed bugs have hatched out. And eggs are a problem because they're the hardest stage to kill with their chemicals and traditional methods. And they're also sticky, so they tend to stick to places. And the female tends to put them in all kinds of cracks and crevices. So you may kill a whole bunch of adult bugs here, or even the immatures, but you could easily miss the eggs, which will hatch out at a later time. And if you're already gone, if your treatment's gone, it continues. They leave rusty spots as they feed. They, they take in far more blood than they, they uh, need. And so they defecate out. And this is one thing that I look for when I'm looking in, for bed bug infestations. You can see the penny here, but sort of these rusty spots on the, the mattresses, box springs is a classic place. So you have this little uh, parasite of human beings that loves little cracks and crevices. And what if it gets into a place like that? How the heck do you treat that? How do you treat New York City? You ever think about it? How do you do pest control in New York City? Or any city? How do you do pest control in these locations? Now, I know how they do pest control in New York City, and there's plenty of pest control companies. You don't have a truck. You have a little hand cart, and you might have one building or two buildings. You might only have three or four floors of a building, and that's your whole area, and you walk to your work. But that's problematic when you're talking about a parasite of humans that can go into narrow cracks and crevices living in an area like that with nine million people. So bed bugs are a problem. But they've been with us since time began, at least since recorded history. It's felt that bed bugs, probably with the cockroaches, were with man in the caves. In fact, when man roamed around, um, probably didn't have bed bug problems or not to the extent certainly that we have now, but when man settled down and started agriculture and staying in one place and lit those fires and made a nice warm environment, the bugs that were on the bats, remember I talked about the different species, but Cymex lectularis will feed on bats, um, will probably came down and said, hey, you know, these bipedal creatures are pretty nice too. And, and, and of the two bugs that I get most now, I get the human bed bug in the most. I still get a lot of bat bugs. And I don't know if anyone in this room has sent me a bat bug, but I've had a number of folks in the Clemson campus come in and say, oh my god, I got, I've got bed bugs. I don't know what to do. I look at it, and I'll say, no, the good news is you don't have bed bugs. You actually have bat bugs. Now, the bad problem is you've got a bat problem somewhere in your house. And not to get too technical, but the way we tell the difference, one is the, the depth of the, this clef here, if you will, in the pronotum is more sharper in a bed bug than in a bat bug. But see the longer hairs on the bat bug? The hairs are longer than the width of the eye, where the hairs on the bed bug is shorter or the same length as the width of the eye. Those are the kinds of things we're looking at if you bring it in and we throw it underneath the microscope. What's the bottom line here? You can confuse bat bugs and bed bugs pretty easily, so you want to get an identification. You want to make sure you know what you're dealing with. You certainly don't want to have a bed bug problem, a uh, treatment, if what you really have is a bat problem. Now, bed bugs, again, have been with man through recorded time. They've been found in fossil beds with human habitations dating back 3,500 years ago. This was really cool. I was, I was doing a lot of research for this talk and read some fascinating accounts. And I, I could have just had the whole talk on this. But the Egyptians drank bed bug cocktails as cure for snake bites. Greeks and Romans would burn bed bugs to loosen leeches. Isn't that cool? Can you imagine teaching that course? That would be fascinating. They also made cocktails with wine, beans, and bed bugs to cure ailments. This is like, sounds like something your grandmother would have made, Lisa. Um, Aristotle had one of the first recordings of bed bugs in his history, natural history of animals. 
believing in spontaneous generation, of course, which wasn't disproved until an entomological experiment in the 1600s using meat and flies and maggots. But bed bugs are generated from the moisture of living animals as it dries up on the outside of their bodies. Wow. And again, there's references, though surprisingly, there are no um, concrete um, references in the Bible. There's lots of talk about insects and plagues and certainly locusts, but, but bed bugs are not mentioned. Yet they do show up in references in Italy in 77 AD, in China, Germany, France, England. This is a wood carving from 1568, and that's pretty clearly bed bugs on that, on that bed there showing the, the problem. Um, and then it was about the 1670s, almost 1700, where pest control operators start to show up. And here's Tiffin and Sons of London, 1690. Not only are they pest control operators, but they have a specialty. They specialize in bugs, bed bugs. And they had this sign over their door of their shop, and it said, may the destroyers of peace be destroyed by us, bug destroyers to her majesty. So I guess they helped the queen or the king out at the time and used it in their advertising but they were ahead of their times, or maybe not ahead of their times, but they're pretty smart. They advocated in their, their literature ins annual inspections and timely treatments. Timely treatments, that's very important. You go on, a, a, you know, 30, 40 more years, John, John Southall, 1730, wrote the first handbook of bed bug control. This gets an extension entomologist excited. It's 44 pages long, and I love this. You know, he's, he talks about this, um, reasons why all attempts hitherto made for their destruction have proved ineffectual, vulgar errors concerning them refuted. That's my favorite line. And of course, after John's um, talk, he had non pareil liquor, which apparently was quassia wood from Jamaica, but it was a top secret recipe. He wouldn't share it with anybody. But it, he, it was this extract from a tree in Jamaica with lots of secondary plant compounds. Not surprising that it killed bed bugs. But after you heard him speaking, he'd sell you his liquor. So over here, I got a case of stuff if you're, if you're interested. But, but really quite, you know, quite interesting. And again, he's saying visiting servants. You know, when people traveled, first of all, it was hard to go from point A to point B. When people traveled, they took their servants if they had the wherewithal. And then no one would expect John C. Calhoun or even Thomas Clemson to have problems with bed bugs or such, or maybe not. But certainly, their servants you'd want to look at and their belongings. And he said, you need to look at the servants. You need to look at their belongings. And this is to. Interesting too, bed should be as plain as possible. The more harborage you have, the more places, remember I said food, water, shelter? The more shelter there is, the more complex it is, the harder it is to control bed bugs and get rid of them. I love this one, the complete vermin killer in 1777. Fill cracks of the bed with gunpowder and light. <laughs> wow, that'd make for an interesting night. I hope they take the rope out before they do that. And that might have been very effective. You know, actually the rope, the rope would be problematic if you didn't get the rope out. And a lot of spring cleaning came dealing with bed bugs. You know, you want to throw out if you're sleeping on hay or some sort of horse hair or some sort of fabric. You need to, to clean it every so often. But a lot of spring cleaning in part was to help get rid of the bugs, the bugs that people lived with. Um, bed bugs were first introduced into the Americas from Europe, um, not surprising. Um, they were, they were uh, documented in the English colonies in Canada, but interestingly, not in Native American villages. In all those names I showed you, and I said there's about 50 of them, the American Indians, the, the American Native Americans, had no name for bed bugs because they didn't have bed bugs. It's another thing that we brought to them. Uh, sailing ships were so notoriously infested with bed bugs, many ships forbid passengers from bringing any bedding on board. So, I was wondering, okay, so we're going up through time. How about John C. Calhoun, this John C. Calhoun lecture series? Um, would he deal with bed bugs? And I was looking at uh, Margaret Coit's book, which was, is fascinating. And on page 49, it's talking about his younger days. And it's talking about attorneys at the time. And they were a body lot. You know, they did trials by day and argued by night. And they may be far from home. And many times, they're going to be spending the night in a tavern. Uh, they may have a lady friend at the tavern, they may not, but at some point in time they're going to sleep in the tavern. And I was talking to Tim Drake about this, it was fascinating. You know, if there was room, you might t choose a room by yourself. But heck, if it's cold and there's no heat and it's winter time, 
in South Carolina, it's pretty gosh darn cold. You might want to sleep next to two or three guys for just for the warmth. So it's talking about how um, the body lawyers of the time would bed down in their rows, usually with more than three to a bed, with bugs hunted out. Now this could mean body lice, head lice, which a lot of people confuse with bed bugs, and they're not. Body lice, head lice, uh, but bed bugs as well, possibly even fleas, but they're checking out their surroundings as they're bedding down. Fortunately, Calhoun was very fastidious. He's pretty straight laced, which is a good thing, especially in his later years, because I went over and looked at their house and I took a picture of his bedroom. I can't imagine having bed bugs in that. Now, this is very opulent. Obviously, to this day, it's opulent, but even for the time. But can you imagine all the places they would have to deal bed with bed bugs if they got into to Fort Hill? It would be very serious. And, and we're talking about the 1800s now with little to no control strategies other than maybe shoving gunpowder into the cracks and crevices and lighting it with a match. Getting a little closer to home time-wise, um, found the uh, 1924 Clemson Agricultural College uh, Handbook. This is the first publication basically on pests and pest control and recommendations for all kinds of pests, agricultural pests uh, and, and such, but house homeowner pests um, that was printed. In 1924, this, this was neat. Uh, Bob Dellinger noticed with me, W.W. W. Long. I had the privilege of working in Long Hall every day. He was the director at the time, Williams, William, William Williams Long. Uh, 1924, I looked it up too because I knew where we were going to be. Um, Jimmy Carter, President Carter was not yet born. Um, he was born later in 24. Um, certainly the Bush one, Bush two, Clinton, Obama, none were born but Strom Thurmond was 22 years old and already a Clemson graduate. <laughs> Thank you, Strom, with a degree in horticulture. But in our handbook, our handbook, Clemson handbook, first um, do a thorough house cleaning, excellent. Then by means of small cans of oil, squirt gasoline or kerosene into all cracks or crevices about the bed, including the springs. How many of you would do this today? even though this was a university recommendation. And yet I still deal with folks, and they tend to be older folks, that will still talk about gasoline, kerosene, petroleum for control of insects, because it was used commonly either as an insecticide itself or as a carrier of insecticides. And I didn't, I still haven't found out what the fumigation would be. It'd be probably fairly scary. But then let's jump up to 1941. Okay, we're getting closer to home now. Another Clemson Agricultural Bulletin, Bulletin 101. Fascinating picture. Here's the homeowner, sure looks like a woman to me. I hope she's at least wearing an apron, and I'm not trying to be sexist, but I'm trying to make a point here. Recommended mercury chloride and applied with a feather to fabric edges, cracks, and crevices. I looked up the LD50 for mercury chloride, it's one milligram per kilogram. In other words, it's very poisonous, it's very toxic. At extremely low doses, they actually used it as a treatment for syphilis. They also used it in, in photography development. But extremely hazardous, extremely toxic, and she's applying it with a feather, with bare hands, to her bed, to her mattresses. Now, we get to World War II, DDT. DDT had been around for a little bit, but it was, it was World War II throughout the world where DDT was widely used. Organochlorine, very effective on all types of insects, long, long lasting, one of its problems and one reason why it's not around today in the United States. And they sprayed the army, the military, treating mosquitoes, fleas, flies, cockroaches, and bed bugs, sprayed down barracks with DDT. Here they are hosing down the mattresses here. They have the, the respirators on but I believe they have bare hands here and they're hosing down these mattresses that obviously someone's gonna sleep in. He's dusting out DDT and they used it and they used it and they used it and they used it and they killed bed bugs and they killed bed bugs and they killed bed bugs until about 1947. And then the first bed bugs in Pearl Harbor barracks were found to be resistant to DDT. And not just a little bit resistant to DDT, a whole lot resistant. Here's a little bit later work, but look at this, these numbers here, going from one day up to, to six weeks. The non-resistant populations, okay, yeah, after about six days of exposure on this filter paper, you kill them. The resistant populations, nothing. So, and the DDT is long lasting, so you're putting it in these cracks and crevices, and it's staying probably for decades, 
But if it's there, bed bugs over time, you can get resistant populations. Now, it's not because the bed bugs get a little bit of DDT and then a little bit more and it makes them stronger. Either the DDT kills them or it doesn't. But if it, it kills out 99.9% .9 of them, but you have that 0.1%, and there's a male and a female, and they really love each other, you get a population starting, and it becomes a resistant population. Why, I, why am I going on with this? Because we still see highly resistant um, bed bug populations to, to insecticides. But you might say, but Eric, we don't use DDT anymore in the United States. No, we don't. But the way DDT kills a bed bug is exactly the same way that these pyrethroid products that you buy now, Delta methrin, Cypermethrin, Permethrin, that's in Home Depot and Lowe's and the pest control operators, the mode of action's the same. So we, have, we still have resistant bed bug populations from DDT times now to the pyrethroids, which can be obviously problematic too when you're trying to control them. The dark side of the moon, I asked Lisa if this would be okay to use, she said yeah. You know, the dark side of the moon, we don't see it, but it's there. But in the 50s, the bed bug population sharply declined, especially in North America and Europe. And by 1960, almost all research and control practices stopped. We just stopped. We stopped doing anything. Uh, there was this monograph of semicity by Usinger, uh, thank goodness, uh, he did this, this monograph, tremendous work, but it sat on everybody's shelf, or nobody looked at it for decades. And you know, so the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s go by. And then around 2000, I'm back at Clemson, extension entomologist, bug comes in for an ID, we do them all the time. I'm like, oh my gosh, I think it's a bed bug. It was a bed bug. I had never seen a bed bug, except on a, a glass cover slip in our biology labs. I saw a bed bug, and I don't know what I got. I, I, didn't, I should have probably tracked it, but maybe I saw one or two that year. And then in 2001, I saw one or two more, maybe three or four. And we, saw, and we knew in the entomological community, pest control community, bed bugs were starting to come back a little bit. But in August 25th, and I looked at my records this week, August 25th, 2010, my phone went crazy. And the semester was starting, and I was teaching. You know, it was always a busy time. And all of a sudden, on this day, the phone and email starts going off the hook, bed bugs, bed bugs, bed bugs. And I had no idea. I was like, what is going on with bed bugs? And it wasn't until six months later that I realized it. Again, we knew bed bugs were coming back, and we knew that they were a problem. But the world's largest pest control firm, Terminex International, a $1.2 billion a year revenue firm, largest company in the world, pest control, all during 2010 was formulating their plans to deal with bed bugs. They decided we're not going to treat bed bugs until we're ready. And they, they set up their control strategies, they set up their marketing plans, their sales plans, and then on August 23rd, 2010, they made their release. And when the largest pest control company in the world throws a rock in the pond, it's not a little ripple, it's a big splash. And it went around the world, and these were all the cities that they listed. You will see that there's no, um, there's no South Carolina city here, but that didn't matter. Within two days, it was on NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox News, all the newspapers, magazines, um, Catawba College in, in North Carolina shut down their dorms to fumigate. They found, do you remember this? They found it in movie theaters. Oh my goodness. They found it in Nighttown, Victoria's Secrets. They were finding bed bugs in Victoria's Secrets in retail stores. And we started to have summits and, and talks, and I'm going to finish up with this. But I think it left most people, maybe like you're feeling right now, like this poor man in bed. Oh my gosh. What am I going to do? What, this is horrible. Well, <laughs> Fortunately, at this time, too, University of Ten uh, Kentucky, along with the National Pest Management Association, did a very comprehensive survey throughout the world, uh, mostly Europe and, and the United States, but they've got respondents in many locations from nearly 1,000 US and international pest management companies, had great return, and I'm not going to share the whole survey with you, but here's some things they found. Uh, professional pest management companies had a reported uh, and dramatic increase in bed bug calls in recent years. So people say, why are they back? What, what's going on? Why? Well, it's, it's multifaceted. And I have three reasons here, and there's probably more than three reasons. But these are three probably pretty key reasons. Increased travel and movement of people, lack of societal awareness and precaution, changing pest control products and methods. See that suitcase right there? That's my suitcase. This, this is my hotel room in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, uh, almost a year ago, last February. 
That suitcase has been to Phnom Penh, Manila, Jakarta, Singapore, Minato, North Sulawesi, Columbia, South Carolina, Hilton Head, South Carolina, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, Rock Hill, South Carolina. So I'm traveling around the world with that suitcase. So moving, there's, there's no socioeconomic group here. Bed bugs can get on any suitcase, any kind of material. It's not from one class or one group of people and be hauled around the world. Interestingly, Cambodia, you know, a developing nation, third world nation, still suffering from the war in the 70s and the 80s, um, doesn't have much of a bed bug problem. But look at my hotel room there. Hard floors, very simple bed, very simple furniture, not all the shelter and places for things like bed bugs to hide. Societal awareness, how many of you do this? I do it now. Pat Sangoli, Bob Bellinger probably do it in the back of the room. I make my wife do it. When you go into a hotel room, you know, if, if they were to have bed bugs, in two minutes you can in inspect your, your bed or your room to see if you might have bed bugs. Doesn't mean you'll always find them. It could be a low infestation. But there are things and precautions we used to take. John C. Calhoun used to take, you know, our forebearers used to take that we forgot about. We stopped doing it because why? Because we grew up and all bed bugs were was almost a nursery rhyme that your mom said to you as you were going to bed. And this is important and this is part of the education and reaching out. And I'll come back to this point and end with it. And changing pest control products. You know, you go into Home Depot, you go into Lowe's, you see all kinds of stuff, all kinds of stuff. The foggers drive me crazy because people think they can go out and get a bomb or a fogger and shoot it off and kill it and it's done. It ain't that easy. Uh, and, and the other thing is, too, in the 70s, the 80s, especially into the 90s, we started to change how we did pest control. A lot of what we were doing, especially with cockroaches and ants, we went to baits. Get them to eat something that will kill them. Rather than spraying out all this insecticide, put out a bait. Well, what's a bait to a, to a bed bug? us. They're not going to eat a bait. They eat us. Unless we took a, you know, like a pill you give your dog or your cat. I'm being facetious. Uh, and a lot of pest control went to more outside. Don't spray inside. People don't like spraying inside more and more. Kids, the pets, the odor, when there was an odor. And so more and more pest control was done perimeter outside. Try to get the pests before they ever get inside. And there was so that we weren't using the longer residuals. We were using different types of techniques. We were using different types of products. And it probably contributed to that slow, steady comeback of the bed bug over the decades. Bed bugs are a much greater problem, the survey said, in urban and suburban areas where larger populations are together. That's not surprising. But look at this 52%, um, um, even though it's higher in, in urban areas, 52% the pest control operators were saying that are dealing with bed bugs is seen in rural areas. This doesn't have to just be in New York City that I just showed you. It can be easily in a rural area because they hitchhike on belongings. Key findings, these were the places that the uh, pest control operator surveyed um, said that they find bed bugs, the ones treating, and they just did a follow-up. in 2000. So this is 2010 data and now 2011 data. Now, apartments didn't really change. So what does this mean here? So for, for pest control operators that choose to do bed bug work, and some don't because it's too hard and too complicated, and they know it's very expensive and they can't compete, uh, the ones that are choosing to do bed bug work, they're saying that 89% of their work in apartments and condos right now is bed bugs. Holy mackerel. And that didn't really change since 2010, 2011. And in single family homes, 88%. Holy mackerel. So they're not going in for ants and cockroaches like we used to think. They're going mostly for bed bugs. But look at the increase now. Hotels, motels, 2010, they reported 67% of their, their jobs were, were bed bugs. In 2011, it's 80%. So I'm not going to read you every number here, but do you see now how the numbers go up? Look at college dorms, Clemson University, 35% in 2010, 54% in 2011. What's the trend? And it's not just in places like hotels, motels, trains, buses, taxis, movie theaters, hospitals, nursing homes are, are really a problem. Retail stores, laundromats, libraries, restaurants, and even airplanes have been mentioned. Do you know what's involved trying to do pest control in an airplane? It's not easy. And where has this left us? All, look at this, this isn't responding. This, the pest control respondents said that 99% of the clients who have bed bugs are upset. Duh. But 77% said such customers were very upset or concerned. 
And what do we have now? The social media. So if you had bed bugs 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and you, what was it, the rule of thumb? If you're upset, you tell 10 people. You know, if you're happy, you tell one person. If you're upset, you tell 10 people. How many people do you tell now on Facebook, on Twitter, on the blogs? It's, it's tremendous. And you can go online if you're traveling to a city and you type in a city and you can get the listing that people have posted on hotels that they've stayed in and whether they had bed bugs or not. Whether that's fair or not, whether it's accurate or not, it may not be. Whether they still have bed bugs or not, you can do this. So it's, it's been a real headache, a real nightmare for people, but also for folks that are trying to run uh, hotel uh, retail businesses. Uh, we did a survey this last year trying to get in now to the flow with, with South Carolina pest control operators. And we asked these questions of pest control, South Carolina Pest Control Association members at our last year, a year ago, at our 2011 meeting. And we asked them these questions, and I won't read them all, but the importance of bed bugs, where they're treating, and so on and so forth. And here's our, here's our information that we got. Uh, ants, cockroaches, and termites in South Carolina, as of last year, were still the top three insect pests. However, I think this might be changing, and part of it goes to that other survey I showed you, the national survey. It showed that in 2010, bed bug revenues for pest control operators was about 5% of their income. In 2011, it was about 17% of their income. So the ones doing bed bug treatments are making a lot more money. The trend is going up. Uh, we found them in the shaded uh, counties. The number just refers to the county instead of its name, like Pickens or Oconee. It's, it's just numeric. Uh, the shaded areas are where they reported bed bugs. Not surprising, that's more in the more urban areas, Columbia, Greenville, Spartanburg, Hilton Head, um, Charleston. And you see the white counties, but you, quite frankly, bed bugs are probably all over South Carolina. This really isn't that surprising. But here, this is good for me as extension entomologists reaching out. The two biggest problems pest control operators were facing was pre-treatment needs from their clients as far as cleaning and re re removing clutter. It's a lot of work. If you have bed bugs, the pest control operator is going to come in and say, here's your checklist of what you need to do. And you might say, I'm paying you $2,000. And maybe for $3,000 or $2,500, they'll do it too. But you're going to be bagging stuff, cleaning stuff, moving stuff. It's a lot of work. And people were not used to that much work dealing with pests these days. And then the other uh, real problem was cost. So bed bug control is not easy. It's not easy, it's not cheap. They cannot be prevented. They cannot be stopped from reinfestation and they're here to stay. Okay, I'm done. Okay, <laughs> here, let's all get under our covers and weep bitterly. No, there's a happy ending. It's not an ending, but it, we're moving in the right directions. They can be controlled. And when I first started getting bed bug calls, Dr. Benson and I have bed bugs, what do we do? I'm like, I don't know. And actually I was going back to Usener's um, um, monograph of simicity because there was nothing else. It was like, what do we do? We have learned so much in the last five to eight years about chemical treatments, non-chemical treatments, mattress covers, disposal, heating, freezing. There's, there's a whole host of things you can do. Far more, I'd go on for hours and hours and hours to talk about it. But there's a whole myriad of integrated pest management strategies that can be used for bed bugs and used successfully. Their impact can be reduced. Their monitoring control techniques are rapidly Im improving. And that's really important. Because if you can detect them early and deal with them early, then you're going to avoid a lot of those horror stories that I just so showed you. And so you remember Mr. Tiffin that I mentioned uh, half an hour ago, you know, who talked about um, doing annual inspections and timely treatments, and Mr. Southall, who talked about you know, simple um, bed frames, and he wrote the first handbook. Well, here's the newest handbook on bed bug control. But these folks, these gentlemen, were ahead of their time. Um, policy. Uh, there's been the first, and of course now the second, a year ago, National Bed Bug Summit, USDA, EPA, DHED, CDC, and I just wrote things down with their agenda included, role of local, state, federal governments, education communication needs, prevention and control techniques, institutional community control. That's interesting when you talk about it. You know, how do you do that? Who pays for it? You know, who oversees it? Research needs, that's probably where we fall in, and we are part of the research community, our lab is, trying to help with solutions for bed bug controls and to help in all these other parameters. And this is all online, which I'll show you in a minute. 
uh, but there's federal and local advisory boards, teams, summits, networks. NPMA, which I have the link to, has come up with best management practices. That's the National Pest Management Association. And they have best practices if you're a pest control professional. But if you're an apartment owner and you have bed bugs, here's what you probably need to think about and maybe do. If you run a nursing home, here's what you probably need to think about and do. If you have a hospital, here's what you do. If you're a homeowner. So they've come up with best practices. They're suggestions. They're an outline. But um, at least it's out there. Five years ago, it wasn't. And then the experience that we're getting, the research and the outreach. There's three things here, which brings us back to this place, Clemson University, a land grant university, which I think a lot of folks forget, lose sight of, and maybe some of our younger college students don't fully appreciate what it means to be a land-grant university. I've always been impressed that during the height of the Civil War, Justin Morrill, a Vermonter, University of Vermont, where we went to undergrad, um, got this act through, Lincoln signed it, provided land in every state and territory to establish schools of higher learning, even the southern states after the war. But if you're going to have a place where you're going to teach folks, how do you create the knowledge to teach? You do research. So the Hatch Act came along, provided funds to pursue research. So we, to this day, we have Hatch projects at Clemson University. Of course, this little date underneath the, the tiger's head here, Clemson University founded. And then these two folks came along, Smith and Lever, Michael Hoke Smith, governor of Georgia and a senator, and Francis Lever, South Carolina congressman, established the Extension Service to, out, to take the teaching and the research out to the people in the public. I did a little walk last week on one of our beautiful South Carolina days, and for those of you who don't know or have forgotten, uh, Asbury Frank Lever is buried at Cemetery Hill, and uh, again, he was the co-bill sponsor of the Smith-Lever Act, which established the, the Extension Service. And on his grave marker, which I think is fascinating, he died in 1940, he says, here rests him, first to bring a nation to recognize the existence of the rural woman as a moving force in rural life. And I bet my bottom dollar that that rural woman, to, to a certain extent, dealt a lot with bed bugs and had to deal with all that. She was probably on the forefront of this problem and the solutions to this problem that we forgot in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and are just relearning to this day. So Clemson, teaching, research, and extension, and finishing up in that mission, especially extension. What can you do? Well, one thing you can do, again, is to be alert, to be vigilant. So this is what I do when I travel. I do, I carry a small flashlight, which isn't a bad idea, whether you have bed bugs or not, right? The power goes off periodically when you travel enough. You uh, place your suitcase in the middle of a room, or if you're really worried about it, you can put it in the bathtub, because bed bugs can't climb slippery surfaces well. So bathtub should be pretty safe. If you don't want to put your suitcase down on a floor where you think, oh, the bed bugs might be there, or on the bed. And then you inspect your bed area. Um, you look along, you pull up the, um, the sheets, the blankets, you look at the piping of the, the mattress. This little bumper pad is a great place to look, that little plastic piece, they all have it, the mattresses. Bed bugs like to get in there. You go up to the headboard, you look by the headboard. I open the bedside table, the drawers. I also look here, right there. What's that thing there? Does anybody know what that is? It's called a phone. How many of you, the last time you were in a hotel, actually used the hotel phone to make a call? Okay, but most of you use this, right? So the hotel phone still sits there. You ever look at a hotel phone? Lots of cracks and crevices, lots of nooks and crannies for a paper-thin insect. So this is the area that you would look for the bed bugs, for those rusty stains on the mattresses, the box springs in that area. And if you find them, then you have a decision to make. I hope you go and try to get another room. Maybe you go and get another hotel. But if you don't look at all, you may be bitten. And, and you may carry some home. And interestingly, on the side, 30% of us don't have a reaction to bed bugs. And this is why it can be a problem in places like nursing homes or other places where you have people, the bed bugs are there, they're feeding, but if 30% don't have any reaction at all, the bed bugs can almost use them as a source, and they're not showing any signs, so people don't know, the populations build up, they start to spread out, and then it's a problem. So not everyone has a reaction to bed bugs. If you're gonna get professional help, look for a good licensed pest control operator, professional uh, society member, experienced, you can get references word of mouth. I like this one, it's gonna be expensive, so get multiple bids, don't go with the first one, but be careful of the guy who says, oh, well they're a thousand bucks, he's a thousand bucks, I'll do it for $50. You better watch out for that guy, I'm not sure what you're gonna get. 
Don't rush. Don't ever feel pressured. If the guy puts a hard sale job on you and says, you, got, you know, like almost sometimes when they sell you a car, if you walk out, this, when you leave, this, is, this deal's over. Don't let a pest control operator do that to you. Take your time. Don't wait a month or two, because the bed bugs are feeding and they're only going to get worse. But don't feel rushed that you've got to make a decision right then and there that afternoon. Take a little time to make a, a, an informed decision, and there's plenty of information out there to make an informed decision. Bed bug treatment is a process. There's not one thing. Go to the store or spray this out, you're done. It's a multiple step process, often with multiple treatments, follow up, um, sometimes over a six to eight week period using a whole host of strategies, many of them non-chemical to these days for control. And it all depends on the situation and the cost as to what uh, is best for you. And I know this is hard to see, but this is a little sheet I have up here. If you want, it's, it's over here on this little table along with some of my cards. But it has uh, the NPMA site that has all those best practices that I mentioned. It has all kinds of good information from the Federal Bed Bug Summit about what communities can do. Um, there's a Clemson University fact sheet, of course, and the University of Kentucky has a great fact sheet. And so with that, I know we're a little bit long, but I want to thank you and say don't forget to look under the covers. <laughs> Question? Couple questions, any questions? Yes, sir. They were, they were around, they were, they were probably still in the United States, but at very low levels. They were also certainly in other areas of the world. Um, India has had a problem for years. They've been in, in Africa. But you, you, it didn't come from one country or one group of people. Uh, at, the, at our last entomological meeting, um, Ed Vargo from NC State has been looking at genetic fingerprints, if you will, of bed bugs around the world, and then looking at populations in the United States. And sometimes when you do that with insects, you can find, oh, these ants or these cockroaches or whatever came from this one part of the world and from this small population, and then they spread. What he's finding is bed bug populations all around the United States are distinctly different. So they came from Europe and Africa and South America and Asia and probably even North America. So lots of different places. It's not one location. Yes, sir. Um, I get that question a lot. If you, if you eliminate the human from the room, how long will they survive? Will they, they'll eventually starve. And I mean, would they last 10 years? No. There's some data that shows that they can go six months to a year. Um, it's really hard to starve them out. They would probably move and try to find alternative sources, a bat, a rat, a possum, something else. Insects are survivors, and once they get into an an urban location, a structure, they do everything they can to survive. So it's really hard to stay out long enough to starve them out, un unfortunately. They just shut down and wait. And they can wait a long time, certainly months. And of course, if you have a hotel room, a hospital room, apartment, a dorm room, you want to turn this around. You can't take it out of business for, for six months or a year. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Any, he said, any, any theories of why the populations declined? No, I think it was the heavy use of the organochlorines and the organophosphate insecticides, long-lasting residuals that um, were effective on bed bugs. And the organophosphates, we, so we didn't get into all this, they do kill the insect in a different way than the organochlorines. Remember I said DDT kills the same way that our pyrethroids do today? The organophosphates were different, but they're gone too. So we lost a lot of these common um, insecticides. So some of the folks that had pest control in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, you remember the guy, the bug guy coming in and he sprayed and it smelled probably. And there's no telling. He could have been spraying DDT at one point in time. He could have been spraying, certainly chlorpyrifos, Durasband. Those, those went away and we lost that longer residual. Now, <laughs> I am not advocating that we bring these, these products back. There's plenty of other ways to kill bed bugs. But that's probably, probably one of the reasons. And tr again, I showed you travel has increased. It's just increasing. And there's more of us. What's the world population now? How many billion are we at? Seven billion? It's amazing. When, when are we going to you know, hit nine, eight billion? And it's some scary number, like 
20 years, 15 years. So our numbers are, are growing too. There's more of us, more of us moving around. Anyone else? Go ahead. Oh boy, do schools and hospitals have programs for these? Um, not like they should have, in my opinion, in South Carolina. This is an area where we could and should do a lot more with integrated pest management for schools and being proactive. And one, again, I didn't get into it, but one thing you can do is have inspections. Don't wait for the bed bugs to show up. And there are people are using dogs now, and they're very expensive. But if, if hotels have a lot of rooms, um, how, you know, how do you inspect these? for bed bugs and dogs are trained and in three minutes a dog can go through a room and inspect rooms. You could do the same thing in a school. There's, and there, there's a lot more that we, we could do rather than waiting to happen. So the short answer is not really, in my opinion, not as they should. Dr. Cheesem. Not sterile male techniques. That's where you, you flood an environment with a male, a lot of males that will mate with the females, and they're sterile basically, so the female won't be able to reproduce offspring. But the female still lives, and the male still lives. And so some of these biological control efforts and using uh, parasites and that, that on things like bed bugs that are feeding on you don't work very well because they take a long time. And people don't, you know, usually if I said to Nancy, you know, you got bed bugs, we're going to release these other bed bugs in your bedroom. <laughs> but <laughs> they'll produce sterile males, feed, you know, offspring, you, no offspring, but they might live three months. You okay with that? She's probably going to say, no. They, I want them dead today. I wanted them dead yesterday. So biological control methods, we still look at them. And in fact, we have a student that's probably going to start looking at fungi and different pathogens for bed bug control but it's always been a, a difficult task in the urban environment, mostly because we don't have the tolerance to wait. We want raid commercial, kills bugs dead. We want them dead now. How dare they be in my house biting me or my children? We're an impatient lot. Yes? Ah, you didn't see the vial that went around. Um, Annie, you got them? Uh, no, no, that's okay. They're, they're about three-eighths of an inch, maybe the size of an apple seed, but very flat. The male tends to be longer and more pointed. The female's more rounded. I don't know if you need to know that. You get good, you go out in the field, you go, well, there's a female, well, there's a male. Uh, yes? Yes. Yeah, You're, that's a really good point. You go online, or you, these travel magazines are selling all kinds of remedies. Get this little spray, spritz it on, get our encasement. You can buy encasements for your suitcase or your shoes. I Actually, I didn't m mention that. I, when I leave a room, I check my suitcase. And when I get home, I check it. I check my shoes, too. They will get into shoes. But I don't encase them. But you can buy encasements. But again, you can buy a lot of these sprays. It, it bothers me as an extension entomologist because any recommendation we're supposed to make is supposed to have research behind it. And most of these products have not been tested. I, ha I know of no study that shows how well they work or don't work and it has a control and replication and all that. A and I'm sure they're making a ton of money. And a lot of these things, if you have liquid chemical X, even if it's from cilantro, and I'm making that up, but you know, mint oil, and you spray it on the bug and it's wet and it's on the bug, yeah, you'll probably kill it. But as far as any kind of residual or long term, probably not. And you, you know, if you want to do things, you can do a lot with soapy water. You could do a lot with, as long as it doesn't ruin your fabric or hurt your, your suitcase, uh, rubbing alcohol. Spritz alcohol on your, your seams when you come back. And if it hits a bed bug, it's going to kill a bed bug. So these things are out there. You can buy them. Uh, but they, they have not been tested. There is a ton of testing going on now. And hopefully, we're going to have more tools 
chemical and non-chemical tools just coming down the pike. And the first person, you want to become a gazillionaire, the first person that makes a cheap monitor that hotels, hospitals, schools can use, cheap, easy to use, that you can put out and catch low infestations of bed bugs as they first get there is, is going to do very well in life. There are some clunky monitors out there. They produce CO2 and our body temperature. The bed bugs would be looking at me right now because I've been gesticulating. I'm warm. I'm producing CO2. That's what they want. Um, and you can buy these monitors. They're very expensive. And their ability to check to, to find bed bugs from the research I've seen is marginal. Any other questions? I've kept you past your time. He's going to kick me off the stage. Oh, oh my gosh. You, you, I already got flowers. I don't need a present. No, you, you, do, you, get, you get the parting gifts that we give everybody here on Jeopardy. Okay. And, Thank and you. I, and I do have to say, I, I knew Donna London would ask a question about Jamaican liquor. I just knew that. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> and, and I can say, I did have an ant infestation in my office not too long back, and, um, and I sprayed them with Pledge. Yes. And, and that worked for one evening. And, and then, they smelled good. And they smelled good. And then the next morning when I came into my office, they were back. But uh, I, I want to thank you again very much. Um, just want to let everybody know that, that the last Calhoun lecture, uh, I'm not sure of the exact date yet. Um, I think it's going to be at the end of March. March 29th? OK. And uh, Dr. Ed Leap, who is an emergency room physician at uh, Oconee uh, Medical Center will be giving the Hunter lecture, and uh, and it will be good to see him again. He uh, actually treated my son Corey for a copperhead snake bite many years ago, and and Corey survived just fine. So I'm very thankful to Dr. Leap. But let's give another round of applause for Dr. Benson. <laughs>